Um, I have been invited to talk a little bit about circularity and how value chains can approach the subject of building a circular economy. And I wanted to start by sharing a few reflections from the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. I'm sure you've followed in the news. They meet every January at the start of the year to talk about the big issues facing the world and, and what we can do about those. And of course, the discussions a couple of weeks ago um, touched on the traditional areas of the global economy and geopolitics and so on. But what I found fascinating was that the concept of circularity and how we build a circular economy was uh, so prominent really everywhere you went. Everyone was talking about it. It seems like um, after many, many years of us um, raising it uh, that the, at a global level, it's becoming really significant. And I wanted to share a few reflections on that. Um, many of the discussions were talking around, were referring rather to uh, this report called the Circularity Gap Report, which is released periodically. Um, and there are a couple of things I think to highlight from the most recent edition. First of all is how much material the global economy is using today. So last year, the global economy consumed 100 billion tons of material. Um, so food, construction, plastic, metal, glass, everything else. And in just the past six years, the global economy has consumed more material than we did in the entire 20th century. So the amount of material we consume is big, it's getting bigger, but what's equally important is the fact that the, the source of that material is becoming less and less circular. So the, the authors of, of this report, they look at whether the material is from a primary source or whether it's from a secondary or a recycled source. And you can see back in 2018, the world was about 9% circular. Uh, 2020, it was 8.5%, and last year, 7%. So circularity at a global level is going clearly in the wrong direction. Um, and that's true of the plastic industry as well. Recycling rates in many parts, not universally, but in many parts of the world are going down. So clearly um, this is something, you know, we have, the world is facing a circularity uh, challenge. And in the discussions that I attended during the, the annual meeting, um, one of the key um, ideas that emerged was that if we want to solve circularity, if you want to build a circular economy, you have to do it in collaboration. This is a systems level challenge. One organization can't do it on its own, one company. One industry can't do it on its own. You need to think at a systems level. And I wanted to share a couple of quotations um, from the discussions that I attended. Um, on the left there you have uh, Mr. Anish Shah, who's the CEO of Mahindra Group. And he said, circularity must be done in coalitions. Circularity at a company level is easier and quicker, but the results are limited. Circularity at a value chain level is harder, it takes longer, but the impact is much, much bigger. And then on the right, you have the, the head of, of sustainability for Lego, the, the toy company, and he said, we can only solve circularity by looking across value chains. The biggest opportunity is not so much working with other companies in our sector, but other industries that connect to us. So we have to think at the systems level. We have to think at the value chain level. And that is a huge challenge. Circularity in many ways is a public goods challenge like many that we face today. You know, we have a, a, a climate crisis. We have a biodiversity climate a crisis. Uh, we have deforestation. These are all public goods challenges and circularity is a public goods challenge that requires system level thinking and collaboration. The challenge is that businesses have traditionally been very bad at collaboration and traditionally have not found it easy to work on public goods challenges. So businesses are fantastic at solving problems, but they're only good really at solving, or historically, at solving what we can call me now problems. Problems that concern the company over a relatively short horizon. Public goods challenges of the sort I've just mentioned, and particularly circularity, are us later problems. They're some way off in the future, and they require all of us to collaborate from now until then to solve them. So businesses traditionally very good at solving me now problems, not at solving us later problems. And so that's why value chain collaboration is very, very hard, but it's critical. And the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, um, we're a young organization, we were started in 2019. We're sort of an experiment 
if you like, in trying to bring together that value chain collaboration to drive this cooperation to solve us later challenges. So I'll just tell you a little bit about how we work as an example, as a case study of how this, this can work. So as I mentioned, um, well, actually before I get there, one thing I think that helps in the context of plastic is that plastic is a huge challenge, an environmental issue, um, and the data there is actually the same that was presented by Dr. Mike Lacey earlier, so I won't go through it. We know that there's a lot of leakage into the environment, but equally, it's an opportunity. There's huge value in plastic waste, and if we can capture that value, then we can create whole new parts to our economy. And I think that's something that the plastic waste challenge has to its advantage. We're not just solving a problem, we're unlocking an economic opportunity. And if we get, but we need collaboration um, to get there. So, in brief, we were launched in 2019. There were 27 visionary CEOs that looked out at the world. They saw plastic waste was a, a huge challenge and they needed to do something about it. So they set up the Alliance to End Plastic Waste to bring the value chain together. So we have chemical companies, we have converters and packaging companies, we have big brand companies, we have waste managers and recyclers, really from all across the value chain. 27 CEOs at the beginning. Uh, today, uh, three and a half years later, we now have nearly 80 companies. So the community is growing, which is fantastic. People are joining our, our mission. And the organization was set up to really drive action, a community of action. We um, are deliberately setting out to raise capital. Um, and then we're working with all of our companies, our member companies, to identify projects that can show a new solution, a new pathway, a new technology, a new business model that can solve this plastic waste challenge. So to date, we've raised $1.2 billion. Um, and we're now investing that money into a portfolio of projects around the world. I should say we're a charity, so we're not looking to earn a financial return. We're looking to earn a sustainability return. We want to show what works and what doesn't work in solving this. And when we find something that works, to share it as widely as we can. So we've got 58 projects. We've raised a lot of money. Um, and now we're, 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 we're and all of this is, is done in a sort of a collaborative way. Our members, they're funding our work but they're also bringing their expertise, their understanding um, to the table so that we can really design something new um, around this. We measure very closely the impact of our projects. We have a set of metrics. Two of the most important are the, the kilotons of plastic waste that we collect and the kilotons of plastic waste that we recycle. And this, these metrics prove whether a project is successful or not. Um, so we're very, very, uh, very um, uh, religious, if you like, in our approach to making sure that our projects uh, really are measured tightly so we know what works and what doesn't. This is the community of companies. We have, as I mentioned, 77 now. Um, you've heard a number of them already talking today. Lyondell, Bazell, Tricon Energy, they're, they're members of our coalition. Um, we continue to grow. But it is cross-value chain. We have PepsiCo and Procter & Gamble and Kirin um, and, and, and brand companies. We have waste managers like Veolia. We have the, the converters like Amcor and Sealed Air and Berry Global. Um, as well as all of the big resin producers like BASF and Dow and, and, and Leandol Bazel um, and so on. So just let me end perhaps with a couple of examples of the projects that we're designing to give you a sense of, of how we operate and, and, and how we're deploying our capital. This is a project that is in Indonesia. And in the emerging markets, um, our projects tend to focus much more on basic collection because again, as you've heard earlier today, that's the big challenge. The waste is not yet being collected. It's being burned and dumped and, and so on. So we have uh, set up partnership agreements with some of the um, regencies in Indonesia, and we're starting in Malang. Um, at, and we have spent the last couple of years designing a waste management system there. The, the material flows, the economics, um, the, the collection centers, the vehicles, everything that you need to run a, uh, a waste collection system. This community in Malang has two and a half million people that currently have no waste collection of a formal type at all. So we will be building their waste collection for the first time. Obviously, you can't build a system only to collect plastic, so it'll collect all the municipal waste. Um, but it will fund itself, um, and it'll fund itself in two ways. One is through the sale of recycled materials. Uh, it could be metal, cardboard, glass, but also, of course, plastic. Um, but also, there'll be a household collection fee. Every household will pay about $1 a month. And through those two funding sources, this will be self-sustaining, it'll be economically viable, um, and it can um, uh, look after itself. It doesn't rely on continued injections of capital for its continuation. 
So we're building waste collection for the first time for two and a half million people in Malang. We've got plans to expand it to two other regencies. That'll be six and a half million people um, in total. And through this, we want to demonstrate how Indonesia can do waste management. And as you know, it's a huge country of 280 million people. So if we can show how it works, then other regencies across the country can adopt it um, and take it to scale and replicate it. Then one from the uh, developed markets. Uh, this is a project in Europe called Holy Grail. Many of you may be familiar with it. It's a, about a technology uh, that, in, uh, that puts digital watermarks. These are like QR codes, but they're invisible to the human eye. And you embed these digital watermarks into the labels of products. So consumers can't see it. The, 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 the label still looks very nice and colorful and attractive. Um, but once you've used a product, and then it goes to um, a MRF, or a waste processing center, there are optical scanners that can read these digital watermarks, identify the product, identify the plastic, and therefore can help to separate the different fractions from the general waste stream. And as I think all of you know, if you want recycling to work well, you have to have very clean um, streams of waste, otherwise um, it doesn't work. So this is a technology to improve sorting of waste. We're trialing it currently in Denmark, um, and the, the initial trials are extremely encouraging. It's got about a 99.5% recognition rate, accuracy, of separating the waste um, and identifying it. So this is, uh, in Europe, you don't have a collection problem. The waste is being collected. But you do have a sorting problem um, in that, that is preventing recycling from taking hold. So that's just two examples of the sorts of projects uh, that we're getting involved in. Um, but as I mentioned, it's all about bringing the value chain together to think in a new way around solutions. This, of course, requires the brand companies to put the, these digital watermarks into their labels, but it requires the waste managers to put the cameras above their, um, above their conveyor belts processing the waste. Um, you need this sort of collaboration to think at the sort of systems level, and that's what we're trying to do. So thank you for your attention. Let me stop there um, and um, hand over to Ramesh.